Hello, and welcome to another episode of Such a Nightmare, Conversations About Horror. My name is Catherine Troyer, and I'm so excited to, as always, be joined by Tony Tresca. Hey there. This is a podcast where the horrifically nerdy meets the terrifyingly academic, as we explore that fine line between the horrific and the horrible. Each episode looks at a specific horror text that is for better or worse, giving us nightmares. And we are so excited to have you join us today for our discussion over 2016's Raw. Just the other day, I was having a conversation with some people about they were asking, you know, like, well, what if you had someone who a student who came to and was like, you know, I'm, I'm just really struggling to watch all these films. And I told them that if it's if it was a horror class, just like a straight up horror class, then I'd be like, well, maybe you should drop. Right. Like if it's one film in a larger canon, you know, we can make exceptions for that. But like if it's the whole class, it's the whole class. Yeah, it's kind I'm, of like <laughs> it's in the yeah. name. It's like, a, yeah, it's going and I to send out be a horrifying. Warning. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like I send out a warning reminding people like it's in the t- literal title of the class. But just in case you didn't know this, I also feel that way because there are certain films I probably wouldn't show to the average undergraduate student. Right. And this isn't a like if you do show anything and everything and feel anything and everything is fair game. That's, it's not a judgment about how, how you do it. It's just that there are certain films that I'm not sure I would feel comfortable showing to someone that has no choice but to do what I say because that I'm in the position of authority. Mm-hmm. And I already feel like I made that mistake a little bit uh, with you, right? And, and having you watch Martyrs uh, so, I, so early I, on. It was a, I feel it was a slightly different position, undergraduate research. It was a part yes. of the research for the for the larger field of horror, which was, again, yeah. I, I, I willingly signed up to be horrified and research the many ways in which horror is. Yeah. So, well, I, and so, yeah, it was different. And that's why, you know, and I, you were also helping me with, like you said, research, right? So it was in reference to, to something I was working on. But then when I was telling this example, people were like, well, what, what films would you never show? And mm-hmm. I'm like, I can name films, but you don't actually know any horror people that I'm talking to. So this will mean very little to you. So I kind of summed it up by saying a lot of French horror. Yeah. Right? A lot of French new extreme horror. And of course, I'm thinking really specifically French new extreme, which brings us back to Raw and, uh, and yeah. to the fact that, you know, Raw is, is a French horror film. And, and a lot of the scholarship that exists really wants to remind us, as it should, of, you know, what French horror is doing and what it's thinking about and what it's exploring. I think I would show Raw to um, the right undergrad class mm-hmm. um maybe like an upper division yeah class. an upper division class where they kind of know ahead of time um, maybe towards the end of the semester when we've had some chance to to talk about things that you've seen but like this is still one of those films that you know it's it's a lot it's it, it is it's a lot in all the best ways but it's definitely it's definitely french horror it, it is and we're talking about it beginning from that academic sense it also I know a lot of people who just saw this film just like in high school. So like even younger oh. than at the undergraduate. Oh. So like this, when it came out in like 2016, I remember this was kind of one of the like popular ones of like, oh, you want to watch something really scary. You watch Raw, this like really messed up French movie. So that's kind of like re- where I was coming in from thinking about Raw before. And all I remembered was like, it had kind of been this very popular popular like example of something that was really extreme horror which i know now is like fits within that french new wave extremity movement right but at the same time you and i both have a of an acquaintance and friend who who saw this film who doesn't watch a lot of horror and who said that she didn't find it very scary and and i agree with her and i see now why i was i was very unsure how this film based on everything i'd sort of heard about it um, could be a film that she actually really enjoyed. But I think a lot of it has to do with, so there's the French New Extreme part, but there's also the part where this is a film about a woman mm-hmm. coming of age and sort of refusing to be in the patriarchal 
male gaze position. I mean, so much of this is liminal. So much of this is about not female empowerment. That's not the right phrase, but it's it's about the female journey. Mm -hmm. And I can't help but think about the fact that the films that consistently get that like label of like, oh, you want to see something real intense are things like Ginger Snaps Mm -hmm. or or Raw or uh, Teeth is another example, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas these films where it's like, maybe the scariest thing is women. And, and I, yeah. I think that's definitely not what the films are saying, particularly because all three of the films I mentioned are, you know, really powerfully being created by women. But I think that that's the response to it, right? That, like, perhaps this film is scarier or bloodier or more disgusting than, say, any number of zombie films because it's it's got a girl doing things that girls shouldn't be doing in their delicate preciousness. Um, I can't help but feel that that's a huge part of why people viscerally react to this film so much. Yeah, so before we get into a bit lar- more of the discussion of the film itself, uh, for our viewers who maybe have not seen the film yet or saw it a long time ago and don't remember exactly what happened in the film, our main character, Justine, is a gifted teenager who is graduated early and is going to her first year of veterinary school. Her entire family is veterinarians, well, their parents, her older sister, uh, and they're all vegetarians. And so this vegetarian uh, is going off to vet school where she goes through intense hazing and is forced to eat some raw meat uh, as a part of this hazing ritual. And then a lot happens and escalates from that initial eating of the meat. Uh, family traumas are revealed. There's cannibalism. It, it gets intense, as we're about to get into. One of the things that's really important about like knowing the, the plot of this film is, is that the entire scene is happening in what the French call, and I'm going to slaughter, bijoutage, uh, which is spelled B-I-Z-U-T-A-G-E, and that's the hazing period um yes. that's for like freshman induction and the fact that they have a word just like the fact that we have a word in english suggests that this is clearly a period that's very intense and, and of course perhaps more intense in the film than not but i think that one of the really important things in understanding the plot is, is how much of this is happening in this weird liminal space and also in this closed community which feels very like lord of the flies yeah and I think it's also respects. it's the fact that these words exist in both the French language as well as the English language show a real commonness to this hazing and this creation of a liminal space uh, through these hazing rituals that are enacted and the breaking of societal boundaries that occurs there and it's okay there. But this film asks what, if, what happens if you keep then breaking those barriers outside of the ritual? Exactly. Because there's so much that of things that are happening during the hazing that it's like none of this is, you know, pouring blood on people. Carrie taught us that that's not probably something you should do if mm-hmm. you want to live. You know, destroying people's property. Mm-hmm. When I think about the scene when they tell them to, to go into the bathroom and not come back until they turn green. Right. And so it's yeah. like just casual sex that is, is not necessarily consensual. I mean, there's so much about it that you know and every so often in the news we'll talk about you know like latest hazing ritual gone wrong i think you're so right that the film uses this space this bijoutage to remind us or to ask ourselves like when is it okay so it's kind of gross mm-hmm. and i say this as someone that eats meat it's kind of gross to eat meat right like the concept of it's really when you think about it not very pleasant but that's okay right just as long as right. it's not certain types of meat but what is the meat that is okay? Well, it's X, Y, and Z, unless you're so-and-so, and then it's not even X, Y, and Z, but it's never A, B, and C, except, you know, I mean, then there's so much, so much that we have crafted these rules for understanding things that are so arbitrary and so artificially created. And I think that the film, by putting us in this artificial time, right, is really reminding us of that, the fact that all societal rules have been made up by someone and will feel artificial to someone else. And I think the placement of a lot of these situations and this journey within a vet school is also deeply interesting because it's humans, one as uh, which are animals, as the film repeatedly shows you over and over again through visual metaphors and just explicit conversation that happens um, and takes place 
in the film. So it's animals studying other animals, dissecting yes. them, doing these things, breaking the barriers between it's it's very it's all very disturbing. That it's yes. that in it, itself is disturbing if you think too far in it. And yet it is all treated with a, the utmost casualness. And that actually fits in really nicely unbeknownst to you with one of our our scholars so what there i know An accidental that. segue i i love it so there is some scholarship on raw there's not a, a ton uh in part because it's it's a film that is not that old and even even within the like dates there there are some scholars that will call it a 2018 film but partially because of when it released you know, to various audiences, like particularly uh, U.S. audiences. So it's not an old film. And so there's not a ton on it. But compared to some films where there's like a barren desert, there are a number of primarily female scholars that have been talking about this film and talking about this film in a number of ways. And one of them, it's actually a duet whose names I will again slaughter. is Martine Bejunet and Emmanuel Delnoy Brun. Apologies in advance. And in their article is called Raw Becoming's Bodies, Discipline, and Control in the film Grave, which is also known as Raw. And and they start out by talking about the fact they say, this is their first sentence, around the 24th minute of the film, a shot of the main character lying in her bed cuts to a mysterious sequence, a dream maybe, and then they sh- they talk about the horse, right? That, that mm-hmm. weird sort of moment with the horse. And they say that there's a couple of things that that calls to mind. Of course, it calls to mind some of the early cinema uh, mm-hmm. and, and the fact that we have the horse in some of the early cinema. But to your point, they're... They, say against this backdrop this being the bijoutage against this backdrop of methodical and ritualized social regulation however disruptive bodily transformations take place Mm -hmm. triggered by a blurring of the biological and behavioral categories that define species-based identities and so they talk about the fact that there are several of these montage either montage sequences or just sometimes these like semi-diegetic semi-non-diegetic moments the other one i'm thinking of is when the sheet is taken off of the dog's body Mm -hmm. and and it it asks us like what is that line right like when is when are we human and when are we not when are we animalistic and when are we not and of course you know there's that gross conversation that one guy has about Mm -hmm. you know like um having sex with monkeys that everyone's like could you not but that again is just the sort of other layer built into this into this film and then the main justine then point pushes the question then of consent of around uh, the sexual relationships with the monkeys. And that's when then everybody in that conversation just begins to be like, no, now you're thinking about these barriers and these boundaries too hard. You, you couldn't possibly then be equating the, the monkeys, these animals with us, the humans who have are superior. Don't, we don't have to treat them very well, which is, what has you, I guess one would have to believe if you were at a vet in school. Yeah. Is that- yeah. And, and, you know, when, when the one girl asks her at the table, like, so are you saying that raped women are the same as raped monkeys? Uh, you know, and, and Justine says, yes, the, the girl makes this face that kind of suggests that like, that's, she wasn't asking if, if monkeys have rights. She was asking if we should lower the status of women to that of animals, right? There's there's sort of like this nuanced element that's in the conversation that Justine doesn't get in part because she's younger and and she's she's less mature uh, biologically, but well as well as socially. And and this film does some really interesting things with taking this character and letting us watch her metamorphosis, but it's not necessarily the same metamorphosis that everyone else is experiencing. Uh, in the same space under these same conditions. Mm -hmm. Particularly because Justine and her family have a particular gift, curse, just kind of affliction and towards uh, eating human meat, Uh, the human flesh. They've got a taste for for human flesh and just it, that's all triggered after Justine has that bit is pressured into well pre- the film asks kind of whether or not she was pressured how much what that line was into eating the meat uh, the yes. kidney and it just yeah one of the most beautiful parts about this film is is undeniably the relationship between Justine and Alex it it is just such a a fascinating 
portrayal of, of women and siblings and rivals and friends and, and everything that kind of fits under that umbrella term of sisters. And the moment when Alex wakes up and, and sees that Justine is finishing off the snack that was her finger mm-hmm. and that's and that like single tear rolls down her face and it just is a silent scene. That was the moment that I if if there hadn't been moments before and there were, but like that was the moment that I uh, that was the moment that I realized that that Julia DeCono is just a fantastic director uh, because they could have done so many different things with that scene. But instead, they gave us just this moment that like haunts you. Right. And and I think that that's one of this film's greatest moments is like you said, is it that there is it a gift? Is it a curse? Is it an affliction or is it just a statement of being that this is their life? Right. Mm-hmm. And and like Alex knows that if, if Justine eats meat, that once she eats meat, she's going to have a hankering for flesh like she knows this and she does it anyway. She does not. Or at least it's implied that she knows this. Right. Yeah, it's in it's implied that her mother reluctantly gave her some information eventually about this thing that would happen. But it's, it is also kind of, kind of implied that both of them were kept out of the dark largely. So I thought, I thought it was that both of them were kept in the dark, but once Alex ate the kidney, uh, you know, the previous year. So she spent the last year having a hankering for, yeah, for more flesh. So I didn't think that the parents told her. I thought she just kind of like she's been on that journey before because she's a year ahead. Oh, um, that that was how I interpreted it. Oh, I I guess that I think that makes a lot a lot of sense. Give, yeah, that given that the parents at the beginning had, yeah. were like trying to get in contact with Alexi, had not were not able yeah. to only going through Justine trying to get there. Yeah, and the having the two siblings be isolated and away from the parental units for a large part of the film really like. It's very Cain and Abel in terms of this, like, rivalry and tension that feels larger than them in this vast way. Because it's just power, truly powerful, the scenes of them kind of having to grow and they're having these fighting tensions, and yet all set to the backdrop of, like, learning how to deal and cope with cannibalism in some yes. tr- just messed up scenes. Like, and it's... I think one of the things that is was so constantly disarming and allowed this film to be horrifying throughout is how quickly this film could escalate from one thing to another. Like you, you look away and they're like, oh, they're just walking down the road. Oh, they're going to like, they're walking there. Oh, nope. They've crashed a car. Uh, and like they're massive app. Two people are dead. The door is yeah. open. They're eating brains. Oh, but as quickly as you're there, nope, back on campus now. We cut yeah. away for yeah. it. Or. Like, just the, you know, we're just going to give you a Brazilian wax. Nope, nope. Oh. We're going to have someone lose their finger. That Nope, wait, that's not all. We're also going to watch someone eat that finger. And then we're going to go. You know, I mean, yeah, I, I think that the film knows how to really take us unexpected places, but places that feel justified upon sort of reflection, uh, which is, a, again, a really sort of difficult task at hand. And I think... You know, I think, for example, of the final few minutes of the film where Justine, you know, could have killed her sister, chooses not to, then bathes her, but also clearly turns her into the police, right? Right. Because, you know, at the very end, her sister's in prison. And and then they have that weird moment where they, like, still love each other. But, you know, again, <laughs> the younger sister is made sure the older sister's in prison. So on the one hand, I think your Cain and Abel metaphor worked well. On the other hand, I think at least as far as how the Judeo-Christian depicts Cain and Abel, they make it seem like there was just the good one and the bad one, and they just had differences. Where this, this film is like, there may have been one that was the good one or the bad one, but we don't know who they are because in reality, good and bad are depend on the moment. So I thought that was just a really well-developed element of, of this film. I, I think it's because it's a sibling relationship that is defies all those clear categories into it it's so it's shifting real all the time who has who has more power who is the one and how they're using that power to help each other or to hurt the other one and it really depends on the second on the situation um and by the end this competition and feud between them just goes so much that they, they can't even control they can't control it and it's happening publicly uh, in yes, the large yes. crowds. And that's when it's just like, that is when the film asks you to be truly horrified of these 
boundary breaking people. And I think it's interesting, those public, a, a lot of those public uh, outbursts at the end, uh, towards the end of the film. But even though, so everyone else is horrified, right? Right. But, but the truth is, is that they're horrified, not by the violence of it, or, or even the, the blood of it, but by the fact that it was a moment that, quote, should have been private. Right. Because the number of times that we just see people casually being very naked and or high and or whatever at various parties, that's okay, right? Right. That form of, of being transgressive is okay. It's just the taboo here is taking your authentic self and making it visible to others. Right, because again, those hazing elements could that they the film begins and could not be, they're the exact same in terms of the student body who is there, the, it, how public it is. It's just the shift from a venue and time uh, that really yes. just, ca- that causes all of those problems for people. And I think that's one of the really interesting things about that the film plays into of asking like how the roles that you get forced into shape you and what happens when maybe those roles aren't true anymore because Justine is forced to grapple with like coming into all of these fam- familiar expectations of an entire family who is veg- who is vegetarian who is also all veterinarians she's top of the class and just all these expectations and roles that she is being forced into and what happens when she's not able to do it these pressures are just all naturally so much. This I, this movie actually shares a lot in common with a new movie that came out this year. Not a horror film, but far from it. If Pixar's Turning Red, I'm not sure if you have oh, you seen I, it yet. I haven't seen it yet, but I know the the premise. Yeah, it, yeah, I think you're very correct. It, they, they're remarkably similar, down to the the use of red symbolism for That's and. True. Pa- the passing on of familiar uh, kind of pains of femininity and being and the particular pains and expectations that society puts on women and how that's passed down through the familiar yeah. unit. Uh, one's a kids animated film. One is this new wave poor extremity, but they're playing on very similar themes. And <laughs> they uh, are. And and other than obviously the like the obvious elephant in the room, which is that the ma- one of the major differences is cannibalism right oh, of course. which is uh, admittedly admittedly not a small thing but but i would argue that that the reason that one of them can be a kid-friendly film versus one of them being coded and read as horror is because of the fact that that raw is making an effort to create a narrative that is ultimately breaking away from from the patriarchal gaze in a, in a way that you know i don't think any pixar film under like papa disney right is, is going to ever really be able to do. And I'm not saying that the film isn't, you know, like female power and things like that. I'm not talking about the patriarchy is purely something that is, is masculine, although it, it is very much masculine, but, but that idea of, you know, society's element. And that is the, the other scholarship I wanted to bring in is a piece by Ursula D. Lu. Uh, there's two E's and a U and a W in there. So however you say that. And She, I like the title of her article. So it's a quote from George Bataille, who said that a kiss is the beginning of cannibalism. And so she's looking at Ra uh, alongside the the issue of of transgression and and how that fits into things and how that fits into particularly Bataille's notion of sacrifice. In, In her article, she talks about the fact that, you know, other scholars have stated that Justine disrupts the patriarchal gaze because her cannibalism is acting as an act of rebellion. And then this fits in with what Ducor- Ducourneau was trying to do, where she says, I wanted to get away from this sort of patriarchal determinism. It was interesting to show a young woman who's not scared. This kind of representation of young girls' sexuality is too common. The idea that it's like losing something, quite the opposite. Justine gains an identity and a unique relationship that cannot be pigeonholed, and she is triumphant. And and I definitely agree that that's so much of what this film is doing. Dulu or Dilau will, will argues that ultimately the film's conclusion, that sort of moment where the dad is like folds her back into the family. Right. And fo- and like gives her permission to be transgressive. Right. Mm-hmm. Cause he's like, you're just going to have to find your own way to deal with it. So the author argues that at that moment, the film sort of ceases to be transgressive because you can't be transgressive if you're part of the system, even if, you know, if you've been folded back in, I don't know if I agree with that. Cause I'd have to really sit with that idea for a minute. But I think that you're on to something really important, and that is that 
both of these films are showing both the raw and and the adorable Pixar film are showing this idea that like what happens right what happens when a girl can be bigger and redder mm -hmm. and uh, then then we have told her she could be uh and I think what makes raw horror is that for many people it's terrifying this idea that someone so small and so feminine would be so violent uh, and so bloody yeah I think the the difference is definitely in a lot of the horror, I think, does come from that public spectacle, that aspect of it, and this kind of, just how quickly the public can turn violent and turn on each other and really correct its kind of, its problems through these this kind of mob. And it, I think a lot of the horror comes from the reactions to Justine and other people's rather than from herself, because it is... She, go, independently as a character, definitely goes all through this reclaiming and finding of herself. She breaks out of the roles and the expectations that were pushed on her and finds her own path. It's a path that is certainly a lot, looks a lot different and is a, than anything we've ever seen before. Yeah, I think, the, I think that's where it's interesting to see that a lot of the horror comes from that reaction. And I think it's from the audience, which is fitting because that we as audiences are voyeurs to this character's yeah. journey. Yeah. And honestly, like, and I know this says a lot about me, it's not the cannibalism that I find the most horrific elements of, mm -hmm. of this it's, film. Do tell more. <laughs> so first, <laughs> before, at the very beginning when they're forced to go to the that like underground rave yes that for would be the ultimate horror to me like the idea of, of being forced against my will to go to parties filled with drunken high sexed up strangers like that sounds like an ultimate nightmare and and that whole space right that whole like just how the school is set up yeah not just in terms of um the hazing although that's a part of it but but even how that teacher acts yeah. Right. And and when he like expects her to be different, but not Adrian. Right. When she, he's like, you know, you're the problem because people like you make it so that other people can't get in or do things or do whatever. But but that's there's a rhetoric there that is similar to a rhetoric that's used to push a lot of women out of STEM. Right. And, and I think so. I think that really bothered me. The doctor who gives her a cream or an ointment, but doesn't seem to like do anything other than be like, you'll just get through this or you won't. Yeah. Right? Like only semi asks psychological uh, questions to see if she's okay. But it's just like, well, you're just being hazed. There was just so much more that to me was, was the source of horror that I don't know if that's the horror, a good chunk of people will pick up on or feel is, is significant. in as the cannibalism becomes a little bit, you know, I think that I, flashy. That those elements of, are the public horror that I that I think the, yeah. the larger source of horror is cut from is that it is the public's reaction to her and yeah. I, that is so horrifying and both in that the voyeur perspective as I talked on and then the your point that you just introduced in the public's reaction to this person going through this period of growth and trauma and not knowing what to do uncertainty and just basically being like well. We live in an individualistic system that uh, we where in which it's not really not really rewarded for doing any extra caring or caring about you or making sure yeah. you're OK. So just going to kind of like say you'll endure it or you won't like that. Like the nurse yeah. said. Yeah. And not just not just her, but <laughs> that scene where she's what was arguably the only scene that was difficult for me to stomach. And that was when she was removing that vast quantity of hair from her throat. Yes. Um. Yeah. That. That I was like, ooh, I don't, mm, nope. Ugh. Everything else was like, oh yeah, eating a finger. And I was like eating while I was watching it, but that part I, ugh. Or, but when she comes out, yes. you know, the girl says, it'd be easier if you use two fingers, right? And then, and then later she, in the film. <laughs> yeah, and then later in the film she does, but like, <laughs> but there's that like weird moment, right? Where, where after Justine leaves, that girl who's not in the rest of the film mm -hmm. was like, la, 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 you know, and is like fixing her hair and like truly thinks she somehow helped this girl. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's just, it's wild to me. Like you said, the, the the things we're forced to watch without being able to to do anything about. And that reminder that that may be how we live a good chunk of the time. Yeah. And I think the is 
there are just so many individualistic like horror elements packed in through it because another one of the like you were talking about the entrance to the space earlier um and all of those like early scenes with the hazing and going into the thing and just one of the things i was so consistently horrified and intrigued by was all of the ways in which we find ways to publicly and systematically dehumanize each other yes the yes. crawling through all the spaces on all fours like and animals. there was no sound at that time right yeah. no diegetic or non-diegetic sound so that like we couldn't sit comfortably with that yeah that stuck out to me too that that scene or uh the motif that was we already introduced the horse that was chained and running and on the, on that and then it being juxtaposed later in the film when Justine um, and her sister are fighting and then they have to be restrained on the ground and they yes. are bucking like those same restrained horses yes. who are totally controlled yet trying to break free from it. Yet, And then unlike the horse, we see that Justine is able to break free and out of it. But it's just all these consistent ways in which we dehumanize and what you're supposed to the film tells us at the beginning sets up this idea that you're not supposed to question these systems and mechanisms that dehumanize you and force you into this way. Yes. That's what, uh, that is what like, we're like, that's what we see over and over again. You are not supposed to question these systems. You call everybody all these names, do this. By the end, you come to a system that's like, oh, that didn't really work. Justine's yeah. sister yeah. broken nonetheless. And, and not only... Not only are Hazy and Bridgeville sort of set up with this idea of like don't don't question the the inhumanity, but it's also the the cyclical nature, right? The mm -hmm. like, but don't worry, the things you're going through someday you're going to get to make other people go through. And so the number of times that the film really reminds us of of the upper class versus the lower class uh, students and and seeing them doing the very things because we see the upper class students that their coats are dirty and covered and stuff so we know they've gone through this right we know that they've they've been there done that but the problem that like you said that this film is addressing is that that cycle isn't actually a cycle for many people right it, and even if it is a cycle first off it shouldn't be one but like there are these groups of people that don't need additional mistreatment or additional sort of categorization as as non-human or as animal because they're struggling enough as it is and they're mm -hmm. never going to be able to like thrive under the system. And, and that's, that's definitely interesting. And we see it even with Adrian, right? There's that scene where right. he gets really upset and he's like, you know, I didn't spend a huge chunk of my life, like hiding who I am so that I could keep hiding who I am later and, and also be sleeping with girls. He's like, I'm gay. And, and so we see this sort of repeated, like, what about these people at the, at the margins, right? And mm -hmm. how are we supposed to, to think about them? when we have built this entire hierarchy of, that's relies on us to have clear, clean cut boxes. How are we supposed to think about them? And then what is so interesting and why I think ultimately this film is so powerful and affecting is how it asks, how are they supposed to think about themselves within this system that is not, doesn't even make any attempts to understand the people on the outskirts. It would just, it's much rather, it would much rather, um, either ignore them, uh, dismiss them entirely, or if they act up badly enough and publicly, film them to make fun of them forever and remind them of their place. To that point, I think this is the one place where the film, maybe by having the sister ultimately be sent to prison, kind of doesn't stick that, that landing that de Cornell wanted to get, right? Because she said that Justine, and, and by extension we, we assume Alex, that they gain something, right? That they gain this unique element. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the fact that there's this really important way in which the consumption of meat can be linked to the erotic, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And it's sort of Justine claiming herself. But at the very end, Justine is kind of accepted, like, this is who I am. It's just a part of me, and that's super okay. But we also have to see Alex be punished, right? For, for having gone too far, for having transgressed too much, if you will. Uh, and that... That's too bad. It would have been, I don't know, you know, if they should have like been on the lamb together, like that might not have worked either. I'm not, but, but I think that the fact the film kind of reins them back in at the end, right. And says like, you can be transgressive, you can be subversive, but there does come a point where you go too far. Yeah. And it's interesting because I think it, maybe then there's a, 
argument to that it could perhaps speak then to the arbitrary nature in which punishment is doled out, particularly yes. to those who are on who are on the margins. And so it's just like I, there potentially is some area for commentary, but yeah, it is it does read a little bit untrue, particularly given that it kind of undermines the when the moment that Justine kind of spares her sister to then you see it at the end kind of still they're separated by prison and whatnot. If they're like if they're you're saying they're the same, they've gone through this extreme journey, they're going through all this, then to see them separated kind of does break that a little bit thematically. Yeah, and you know, there's I think a couple of mo- those moments sort of throughout because if are we supposed to see sort of Alex as the equivalent of of Quickie, right? The dog that that like gets punished and, and why you know, of course, it's like, why does Justine not fight harder to save this animal when she clearly believes so fully? And so there are a couple of moments that because this entire film is, is attempting to give us this surreal space, mm-hmm. we're always between moments or mainly between classes. Yeah. Right? It's never day or night. It's it's usually like some sort of either twilight uh, or dawn moment. You know, there's so much of the film is in these between spaces. So it feels very surreal. But I think the result is, is that there are a few places where the logic of things, you have to be okay with the fact that it's not going to resolve itself as it yeah. probably should to be, to offer narrative consistency. But I think that then it remains still true to the, to this larger spirit of it, even, even if it doesn't quite spit the landing, because it is about creating this kind of ethereal journey and it kind of, ha- I guess it has to end at some point. And I don't, I, you're, I'm not in love with where it does totally choose to end at the prison. But I think I like so much where it goes in the next scene after that, that I think it yes. ultimately, with the father reveal of that, like yes. the chest, that I think ultimately that one kind of break in it wasn't enough to like pull me out of the, yeah. the effectiveness of the larger experience. Yeah, I will say that very last scene uh, with the father was fantastic because when he was smoking, of course, it draws its, your attention to his mouth right. and the fact that he has scarring on his upper lip and that should remind you that Justine bit someone else's lip. But of course, you know, to see just the extreme to which it's it's gone on and arguably continues to go on, right, is that that was unexpected in, in sort of the most delightful ways possible. And then that raises all sorts of other issues, right? Like, I don't know, maybe I wouldn't, but I feel like if I was cannibally, and not like a cannibal by choice, but by a cannibal by like genetic design, mm-hmm. I, I feel like I would tell my kid, right? Like, hey, by the way, you might have a high chance of this. But at the same time, we do this all the time. How many people procreate knowing that they're passing on something that's genetically not not the most fantastic thing to be passing on, right? They're like, yeah, we our family has a history of X, Y, and Z. I can't wait to have kids. And I'm like, really? Like you, you're you going to be okay with the fact you're going to pass on all of these genetic markers? So we do this all the time, which again, just adds that nice layer. But but that was like, come on, mom, five minute conversation, five minutes. But it would be the hardest five minutes and it would reflect the, it would <laughs> force, it would break the roles that they, it would. that these that these characters had been grown up in with this expectations that they put on each other. Cause it works both ways. Like it doesn't, the roles that they were, the, this, they were forced into as sisters and not knowing all this information uh, goes the, back to the parents. They weren't, they were these almighty figures. They couldn't tell, they couldn't share any of their faults or their truths. They, so to share that information would be to give up the, the power of these, some of the roles and make them admit their humanness, which is uh, something that is doesn't is a sin of many familiar units, which is why I think even when it's so abstracted in this film, it's so powerful because it's it hits on so many truths uh, yes. throughout. And this is something I I always tell my students when they're writing horror, you know, that like hopefully your readers or or whomever they're not gonna be able, like, oh yeah, I remember when I was in veterinarian school and experienced incredible hazing and also started eating some people that's that rings true but (laughs) but what should ring true is like you said justine's coming of age narrative where she's realizing who she is and and how she fits into this equation 
and that and then having to take that equation in in this chaos and whatever that that was school and bring it back home and it, and you know that part the part of of the idea of what it means to shift into adulthood and then still have to live within the confines of your family unit that should bring you know incredibly authentic to anyone who watches this film authentic real raw no <laughs> And there it is. <laughs> were you savoring that? I feel like you had to be like, were you holding on and just waiting to be able to insert the word raw? I, I was, tr- I was trying to figure, I, I honestly, no, I, I can't say that I was. It just, I followed the moment. Okay. So I, you know, you set me up so I could bring in my scholarship. I set you up incidentally so that you could bring in your pun, you know. And now is- the episode is done. It's complete. Again, <laughs> what more could we possibly do? I'm really glad that we looked at Rye. It was a good film. I, I wasn't sure what to think because, like you said, it has a very specific reputation. Mm-hmm. But I, I can't help but feel like that reputation is, is a little bit of a, of a gendered one. Uh, and it was just a good film. It was a good film and it was it'd be an interesting film to, to sign in a course on on women in horror Mm -hmm. i think so it's a great film very deeply interesting i also liked uh not didn't talk a ton about it but it's a humorous too in a a way that is just delightful so really glad we got to talk about it very different from where we're going next our (laughs) our next episode is switching we're going we're going back to the screen franchise we are going to be doing our last episode uh, over Scream 4. Uh, yes. We already did an episode on the new Scream, Scream 5. So this will be our last one in the series. So join us next time for our episode over Scream 4. Yes. But even though we're going to like drastically shift tone uh, with Scream 4, <laughs> which really, like, I think if you were to play the game of like, what, what is a film that couldn't be further away? Scream 4 might be that answer for Raw. <laughs> but we are going to kind of keep up for a little bit mm-hmm. our our ex- examination of of cannibalism slash what is that line when are we human when are we not and so I tell you all now because we're coming back to one of our sort of semi regular episodes on books yay so between now and of course you're going to tune in for Scream Four but then our episode after that is going to be on the Argentine novel Tender is the Flesh, which if you're reading that for the first time, or even if you're rereading it, you're going to know exactly why this fits very nicely in our like cannibal unit. So in get the meantime, reading, though, <laughs> uh, yeah. get reading and check out our social media where you can get in touch with us. It's all in the description of this podcast. Please rate us uh, wherever you listen to your podcast. It helps get us out there. If you have any questions, get in touch with us in the email in the description. Thank you so much for listening. Yes, thank you for listening to our nightmares. And have a spooktacular day. <laughs>